Welcome to the Dr. Berkson's Best Health Radio Show. And you know, I remember when high-end jeans first kind of came into the market and everybody wanted designer jeans. That was the big deal. Nordstrom sold them and you could get them at private trunk shows, but designer jeans were the deal. Well, now it turns out that medicine and medical doctors are diving into whether you have designer jeans or whether you have low-rent rendezvous jeans and what that means for treating you the best that they can. In fact, what that even means for COVID. We're looking at your genetic deal of the cards and what that means for your vulnerability and what that means to shore you up, even if you're born with a vulnerability, to make you the best version of yourself that you can. So we have on the show today a genomically trained physician that I have the honor to be working with in Naples, Florida at Dr. Perlmutter's old clinic, which is now called the Cent- Naples Center for Functional Medicine. His name is Dr. Eddie Maristani. He is a hunk and he is a brain and he is a brilliant guy in your genetic deal of the cards. I'll tell you just a tiny bit about him and we'll let him get talking. He got his medical degree at Ross University Med School. Then for seven years, he was a very interesting thing. He was an academic hospitalist. This means somebody who's on staff at a hospital, but also has rights to be a professor because they've got both sides of their brain going. You know, they are an academic and they are a clinician. And, you know, we always say on the show, we want smart plus heart. So that is what Dr. Maristani also is. He's one of the rare physicians that's IFM certified, means beyond his medical degree, he became certified as a functional doctor. But he's also trained in genomics, especially in a brand that a physician here in Austin has um, spearheaded, and he's been using it in his practice. And today in the show, he's going to talk about genetics being used by docs, and he's going to give us some case examples. So welcome to the show, Dr. Maristani. Can I call you Eddie if you call me Lindsay? Is that okay for the show? Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, Dr. Berkson, I'll call you Lindsay. I appreciate that. And I appreciate being on the show. I think you're a fantastic clinician. I think you're a genius. I think you're way ahead of your times. And uh, uh, very few people can um, marvel in in the amount of uh, genius concepts that you have on a daily basis and the context you have. Pretty incredible. So we're very happy to be working with you also at the Naples Center for Functional Medicine and privilege to be there working by your side. I know you have easily uh, three times as much experience as I do. And so we really appreciate that. (laughs) Boy, I would want to dive deeper in this if the show wasn't on you, but the show is on you and we're lucky to have you. Thanks. That was so sweet. I didn't even pay him for that. I didn't even make him one of my (laughs) Lindsay meals for him and his beautiful uh, partner, Crystal. (laughs) But anyway, can you explain to us what genetics is and how a doctor might use it for a patient? Sure. So typically, uh, patients um, know genetics as medical genetics. For example, if you're a woman with breast cancer and a lot of breast cancer in your family, you'll go to a medical geneticist uh, per the recommendation of an OBGYN to get the BRCA gene evaluated. But the BRCA gene is very rare. It's actually extremely rare. So if you have the rare BRCA mutation, it defines 100%, 100% chance, basically, that you're going to have breast cancer. So uh, those are medical genetics. Those are very, very rare gene mutations. What, what we're doing is what's more common, which is called genomics, which is what's in most of the population, and it defines a larger percentage of cancer, not just breast cancer, but all types of cancer. It also defines a lot more disease. So it's a lot more practical. It's a lot more um, efficient, in my opinion, because everyone's going to have these uh, abnormalities. And 23andMe and other companies are starting to analyze this data, but they're not really giving uh, people a lot of information. They're just giving them a little bit of minimal information. Whereas if a physician actually counsels you on your genomics, you can have life altering results because they get very specific. They get very detailed. Um, For example, on our gene array, we'll go over 700 to 900 mutations and how they affect you. Can you explain just one more time what a mutation is? So uh, we call it mutation, but it's a single nucleotide polymorphism. So basically, you're, you have 20,000 genes. And within those genes, you have about a, two, uh, about a million different variations in how the letters are expressed. So you have four letters that comprise your entire DNA. What are the a, letters? A, G, C, and T. 
And so- What does if, that mean, letters, though? For the person listening, what does that mean? They're going, you have alphabet soup in your genes? What, is, what do the letters mean? So the letters are just like a computer code, like computers are zero and ones. So your DNA is a little bit smarter. So it has A, G, C, and T. And the, and the different letters combine with the one leading strand with the other strand of DNA, they kind of combine to form your DNA. So basically, if you're supposed to have a, a position A, a letter A, for example, and instead of the A, you have a G in that position, that's called a single nucleotide polymorphism or a change in what's supposed to be a, a, a is now a G. So would it be and like so, you're supposed to have healthy personality types and you right. might have an abnormal personality type. So mutation right. is a glitch. It's a, it's glitch. a glitch. Okay, there we go. It's a small glitch in your DNA, exactly. It's very common though. For example, uh, the MTHFR. Everyone, everyone's heard or a lot of people have heard of the MTHFR gene mutation, the SNP. It's as common as in 40% of the population. So you would say, well, that might not mean a Wait, lot. wait, one second. Why do they call it a SNP? You just threw that out there. So Oh, so a SNP is just a word for single nucleotide polymorphism. S for that glitch? For that glitch? Yes, for the okay. glitch, right. So SNP so is a SNP, glitch. A SNP is a glitch, exactly. So if you have a glitch in the MTHFR, and instead of having you know two Gs, you have one A and a G now, um, even though that's common in up to 40% of the population, it can significantly increase your risk for heart attack, stroke, cancer, psychosis, paranoia, mood disorders, anxiety, on and on and on and on. And it's such a simple fix. You know, it just means that you can't methylate uh, folate, which is a B vitamin. So for if you have that SNP or that glitch, all you have to do is when you take a B vitamin, instead of just taking regular folate, just take methylfolate and that fixes the glitch. Because you couldn't, because that glitch makes you not methylate, and you can take a folate already methylated, like a pre-digested B vitamin. Exactly. Once you know your genetic code. Exactly. So that's why we use it for nutritional counseling and for supplementation counseling. Because we, I love functional medicine, but I would rather instead of giving you thirty supplements blindly, I would rather give you the seven that you really need. Because you're gonna more, you're, it's more likely for you to take those seven. Than 30. And so that's why I love the combination and the, the marriage between genomics and functional medicine, because it's really how we're going to live the, the best of the best lives that we can live. Because I want to take, when I, when I go to a medical conference, I want to take a hundred supplements because every supplement is good for you. But what do I actually need? What do my genomics actually need? And that's why this, this genomic tool is very important. Another great example is a B12. A lot of people take B12 shots because they say that it makes them feel better. Well, actually, we can now identify the 19% of the population that actually benefits from B12 shots, because there is a percentage of the population that can't get enough B12 into the brain, into the cerebral spinal fluid, into the, into the brain area, because there's a carrier protein that's mutated. And they've done studies that if you give those people with that mutation an injection of B12, and you get their B12 levels astronomically high in their bloodstream, then the, the carrier protein can work and bring it to the brain. And so that's why about one in five people will say, gosh, doc, when I take that B12 shot, I feel fantastic. I'm, I'm wide awake. My memory's better. I have more energy. And four out of five people say, no, it doesn't do anything. So now we can actually identify who actually needs a B12 shot, who needs to methylate folate, who needs, and it goes on and on and on. That is absolutely brilliant. So if I were to just summarize this in a graphic, like a meme, yeah. If I were to say that we have our body is a house, a building, and the architectural rendering of that building might have some little glitches where the stones are a little broken or the lumber has some mold and d defects in it. And if you knew that, you could shore up those pieces of the house so it won't fall down. Instead of buying a new house, you can, you can fix it. Exactly. So what people are doing now is they're just, they're just waiting for the house to crumble. And then they, then they oh yeah, the foundation was bad. But now we can identify years ahead of the disease that your foundation is going to crack. So you might want to go ahead and reinforce that foundation. And it's incredible. And it's incredible. And, and this tool was created by a Harvard integrative medicine doctor who's a genius, Dr. Sharon Hausman Cohen, her team. I mean, they've been, they've been, they have 10,000 articles backing up all the suggestions, all the recommendations. Most of the data is tier one evidence, which means it's very, very strong evidence so it's not like someone's just making this up. We have lots of articles and publications suggesting that if you have 
the MTHFR gene and you're at increased risk for cancer or strokes or heart attacks, that if you take the methyl folate, you're now decreasing your incidence of all these diseases. And we can actually show you this. Um, so it's pretty incredible. So I, think I have one question good. about that methyl, methylation gene. So we learned at A4M that you can be more vulnerable to cancer if you under-methylate or if you over-methylate. Right. Exactly. Are there some genes yeah. that tell you if you over-methylate and you should be careful not to take too many B vitamins or B12 shots? Yes. Uh, so there are different genes that we look at. I think in general, we try to avoid certain supplements, for example, SAM-E. SAM-E will potentiate over-methylation. So we try to stay, we try not to use SAMe so much. And if you and if you use a decent amount, like one or five, up to five milligrams of methylated folate, you should not run into the overmethylation problem. We've actually had this brought up at multiple conferences. We've had integrative oncologists that were asked the same question, and so their basic response was, depending on your genes, depending on what genes you have, we'll see whether you're a, a, most people are pretty normal methylators, I would say about 50%, and the other 50% are going to hypomethylate. You're going to methylate too low. The problem is if you give too much methylators, like SAMe, that could potentially cause a problem. Do you think so, everybody you know, that's had cancer, any single person that's had a serious diagnosis of cancer, not maybe skin cancer, but like a breast cancer or a colorectal cancer, do you think that suggests one specific issue with their methylation? Could you comment on that? Uh, that's, uh, that's a hard one. I think detox is a major issue with cancer. So if you have cancer in your family, I, I look at the methylation genes. I also look at your detox genes because if you're not able to detox heavy metals or, or organophosphates like herbicides and pesticides, if you're not able to detox the things that we're constantly coming into contact with in our environment, then you're a most, uh, um, much higher risk for cancer of all types. So I think when you see cancer, you have to think detox, you got to think methylation, and you got to look at also very rare mutations like the BRCA1, BRCA2, these type of mutations. But those are so rare, that's less than 1% of the population. So 99% of the population is going to be detox and methylation. Boy, people are really lucky when they go to you because you combine nutrition with genomics, but you also use hormones. Because in my new textbook that's not out yet, I talk about, for example, the role of estrogen in the parietal cells, then going to the liver. And estrogen allows detoxification to take place. So there's this intimate uh, interaction with all of these elements in the body. And you have made very rarely, honestly, there's so few docs that have these domains under their belt when a patient walks in to help them out. So Gosh, you know, I have to tell you that my plan is um, a yes. little bit over the next few months to come see you as a patient myself to get this genetics myself because I'm so pleasure. excited that you you have this bigger picture. Yeah, I'll, I'll charge you double because you're going to need more time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, no, that'd be that'd be fantastic. Between your knowledge and of the hormones and, and our knowledge of methylation, you're going to be really fascinated. And I have some case examples too if you want to hear them. They're just interesting cases because uh, a lot of people – they want to see where the rubber meets the road. Okay, so this is all great in theory, but what does it actually do? And so uh, this is my first patient. This is just an example. I've done this already on about 150 patients. Um, this is my first. And by the way, every patient takes uh, two hours. I have to counsel them for two hours based on how much data is there on how to eat, how to drink, what kind of exercise they have to do, what kind of supplements they need, what they're at risk for, what they need to watch out for. And it's not just supplements, it's medications. It's disease varying for, I can tell you your, your odds ratio for macular degeneration, diabetes, hypertension, heavy metal issues, osteoporosis, like the Alzheimer's, and the, the list goes on and on. Uh, another thing a lot of people don't realize is Alzheimer's, there's about 200 genes involved in Alzheimer's. It's not just the ApoE4. ApoE4 is the most uh, recognized, the most uh, significant, bless you, <laughs> but it's not, it's not the most important actually. Uh, because when you combine all the other genes, I have plenty of patients that have Alzheimer's and don't have the ApoE4. So you have to look at the vascular component. Like, are you going to have lots of small vessel ischemic changes? Are you going to have lots of micro strokes? Are you going to have other reasons for having dementia? Are you having heavy metal issues? Um, it's just fascinating. Another fascinating thing is that some people carry a gene where if they have a certain type of anesthesia, they can wake up from anesthesia with a Th odds ratio of three for having Alzheimer's. That means a three times higher risk of developing Alzheimer's just because they received a certain type of anesthesia, which is crazy because you'll hear the stories of someone in their 60s 
who's playing tennis. They're very active. They have a knee, a knee problem. They go for a knee replacement and they just all of a sudden deteriorate significantly after the knee replacement and their minds lost and they kind of, you know, go down the gutter in five or 10 years. And you wonder why did that happen? Well, because they had that gene with the anesthesia. But if you so, identify that gene and you know one of your patients is going in for surgery, you can give them guidance of how to avoid that potential bad outcome? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And it's not just it's not just older people. So I've I've heard this before. People that carry this gene will tell me oh, Which gene you know, is this? Which gene is that? It's one of the BCHE genes. So it's a way you basically digest a colon, cholinesterase. So it's a cholinesterase gene. Um, and so and that's the, that's the enzyme that helps lube all your neurotransmitters talking with the, and communicating with each other. So you got good conversations in your brain. Yeah. Cause yeah. Cause the main neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. That's like the main, uh, pathway signaler in your brain. And if you don't have enough acetylcholine, that's going to be a problem. And so what happens is this anesthesia stops your brain from producing that acetylcholine, and that's why you become paralyzed. So it's a paralytic. And I'm referring to an anesthesia agent called succinylcholine, which is a paralyzer. It's, a, it's an inducing agent. It paralyzes your body. The problem is if you have this gene variant, you already have trouble creating acetylcholine. And now this anesthesia has removed acetylcholine from your brain, and now your body can't get the acetylcholine levels back up quick enough, and hence you go brain dead, essentially. Are these people that have that genetic variation also more at risk for taking antihistamines and pseudofedics, for example, because those are uh, uh, cholinesterase inhibitors? Exactly. Right. So that's exactly right. So these people that have these gene variants, I recommend they increase their, their intake of choline in their diet because choline is a precursor to acetylcholine. So they want to eat more fish. They want to eat more eggs. They want, or you can get, if they're vegan, they can eat soybean based acetylcholine or choline. Um, so yes, there's, there's all types of things that we can do. We can suggest because those people are going to be more sensitive to antihistamines and to all these drugs that are going to affect your uh, acetylcholine levels. Right. People come in living on antihistamines, but Scary. they might have the genes that they are yeah. actually dimming their brain down and, yeah, and you can then guide them about how to turn the light back on. Yeah. And if anyone's living on antihistamines, please try quercetin. Quercetin is incredible. It's a natural antihistamine with no side effects. You can take 500 milligrams twice a day. I get lots of people off antihistamines like Zyrtec and Claritin. I mean, if you need something strong, then take Benadryl, Zyrtec, or Claritin. But for long-term chronic use, quercetin is a lot better. I have a question for you because we're talking about um, acetylcholine. Do you know which plant in the plant kingdom has the highest amount of of acetylcholine in it. So I often use it to kind of lube neurotransmitters as food is medicine. Dum, 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 Is it dum. St. John's word? I don't know. It's nettles. <laughs> nettles. Nettles, nettles are quite Seeing extraordinary. Nettles. Yeah, so nettle yeah. extract is quite extraordinary for the brain to lube neurotransmitter functionality. That actually makes a lot of sense. I, we, I, I use stinging nettle for allergies as well because stinging nettle is also a natural mast cell stabilizer. I didn't so, know that. Yeah, so, so cool. if, you, if you drink nettle tea, it's great for allergies. And you're right, the steam nettle is in a lot of our brain products. But there you go. I didn't realize it had so much acetylcholine in it. There you go. So we're looking forward to hearing your case studies for examples of how you use genetics in medicine. Sure. I'll just give you a couple cases. What, this is my first patient, pretty classic. She's a 30-year-old. She used to work with me. She's a nurse You mean practice. your first genetics patient or your very first patient or... No, no, no. My first genetics patient. Gotcha. Okay. So I, had been, I had been practicing medicine for about 10 years. Um, I was still an academic hospital physician at this time. And uh, this is a colleague. She's a nurse practitioner. And she would work like 14 hours a day. She was always super stressed out. And then she figured out I was doing genomics. And then she came to me kind of frustrated saying, I have had migraines my entire life. Um, they're about three to four times a week, no matter what I do. For at least 10 years, they've been occurring. And I've been to three neurologists and no one can help me. So if your genetic test can help me, I would be, you know, forever, you know, forever grateful. And I said, okay, well, I don't know what I'm doing yet. This is, you're my first patient. I said, let's, let's roll the dice. Why not? Let's try. I'm not going to charge you anything other than the price of the test because I don't know what I'm doing. Let's just have fun. And so sure enough, so she did the genetic test and um, her traditional doctor had put her on Elevil, which is an antidepressant, Imitrex. Relpax, Excedrin, high-dose magnesium, 
Uh, I mean, everything you can imagine and, and nothing helped. So she's still having these migraines about three times a week. Now, when she did take Imitrex, it, it helped abort them, but she was still having migraine for three or four hours. So it was pretty miserable. And she would have to often call out of work. And obviously I would see her call out of work. So I knew it was, it was a problem. So then what I did was I ran her genetics and then I, so this is about methylation again. So I saw that she had a copy of a, a SNP uh, or a glitch in the MTHFR C677, which is the main MTHFR gene. And the second main MTHFR gene, which is the MTHFR A1298C, she also had a glitch. Now, what's interesting is that those glitches are common. So if you have a copy of the glitch, it's in 40% of the population. But to have a copy of each glitch together, now you're more like in 15% of the population. Then she had another MTHFR SNP with another SNP and MTRR and then COMT, COMT. Basically, when you put the odds of having all these SNPs together, it was less than 5% of the population. And so I told her, I said, you know, I, I, I'm going to guess that you're a really poor methylator. And what's happening is that when you don't methylate your folate, you don't activate the folate, which is a B, B9. If you think about folate, it's the most important vitamin in a pre, prenatal vitamin because the babies need the folate for brain development, for neurological development. So if someone's having migraines, doesn't it make sense that if something's going wrong in the brain, that maybe they can't activate their folate? So I said, let's just give you methylated folate, about two milligrams a day, in addition to methylated B6 or methylated B12, B6, and some other things that are going to help with methylation. Any B vitamin that needs to be methylated to be active. Let's just throw in the pre-digested Bs. Exactly. And then also give us support vitamins like zinc, magnesium, support the COMT enzyme. Comport. So we support all these things. So I gave her, I gave her methylfolate, methyl B12, pyridoxine B6, TMG or trimethylglycine, which is another uh, promethylator, riboflavin, magnesium, and zinc. And then because she was so stressed, I gave her ashwagandha because to reduce some of that, so those, those high cortisol levels. And I also gave her fish oil because actually a lot of people don't realize this, but fish oil also helps methylation. And people don't know that, but there's tons of studies on studies. Now, on there's several, two types. There's DHA and EPA. Is Does one of the fish oils help methylation better than the other? So great question. Um, the studies I saw were on both. So what I, I normally do is I give both. I give half EPA, half DHA, because DHA is needed for the brain and the spinal cord, and EPA is needed for the heart and for your, 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 the rest of your body, for your muscles. So I like to use both. And so I gave both. And so it, I had a two-week follow-up with her, and I was shocked. She said, she said, literally, she's a doctor. I don't know if this is a placebo effect, but I haven't had a migraine in two weeks. And I was like, holy smokes, that's amazing. That's eight migraines less than she should have had by now. And I said, oh, wow. I didn't even believe myself. I said, yeah, this probably is a placebo effect. Just uh, keep taking the placebo for now because it's working. And uh, I, was, I was just happy. So then I followed up two weeks later and she looked at me. And she's just like, this is amazing. Uh, I haven't had a migraine in a month. This is the first time in seven years that I felt normal. And then she ended up, uh, she was pretty emotional. I was emotional too. I was like, this is incredible. Uh, she ended up weaning off her Elevil. Uh, she weaned off all her migraine medications and had no migraines. Now, that's a month out. So then I said, okay, hold on. Let's follow her up two months out. Let's follow her up three months out. 12 week follow up. You've cured me. And then her next thing was, her next question was, can I work for you? <laughs> and I was like, yes. I was like, yeah, probably, you may, maybe actually, we might have a spot for you in the future. Um, but, I have you know, one question. You said that she said that she had not not had migraines for seven years. So does that mean when she was younger, she didn't? And even though your genes work against you, when you have youth, you might still overcome the genetic deal of your cards. But then as you age and you have less of the life force, unless maybe you're like you and I and we're trying so hard to hold on to our life force, is it was that the deal? I mean, why didn't she then have migraines her whole life if she had this these gene so many gene glitches. That's a great point. And I think it has to do with environmental toxins. I think as you get older, you accumulate more and more and more environmental toxins. And then eventually your body just can't, you, you hit the threshold and your body can't cope with its limitations anymore. And it starts to break down. That's, I think I see this all the time. And most people, even if they have the gene for something, they don't express it until they're older. 
Okay, that's good to know. That's good to know so, because there's a lot of naysayers, you know, naysayers. Yeah. They don't believe all this stuff because they're still practicing algorithmic medicine. And they say, yeah. if that were really true, then we'd be seeing this from birth. Now that answers it because that answers the retort to a lot of the naysayers. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Maristani. And, and what I also want to make a point about was when people have bad methylation, you can check a biomarker in the bloodstream called homocysteine. Okay. Now I didn't have the chance to check homocysteine on, on her because she, I was just helping her on the side. I didn't even get, like, he wasn't even my patient. I just gave her some vitamins, but now I'm checking homocysteine on all my patients that have, um, MTHFR gene defects. And sure enough, they have higher homocysteine levels than they should because homocysteine is a byproduct of not having enough activated folate because your folate basically clears homocysteine. But, and and that I, explains why so many people as they get older have higher and higher levels of homocysteine, which is like a hammer to the brain. It's a sticky, nasty substance to the brain and it makes a lot of your aging symptoms occur, but you yeah. can bring it down if you help clear it. Yeah. And homocysteine, I, I call homocysteine a terrorist, okay? A double wielding terrorist. The reason I say that is because People don't realize how bad it is. And no, and traditional doctors are not checking homocysteine, which I don't know why. They don't even, it's, they don't believe in it. Like they don't believe in yeah. Monday. I'll believe in every week, day of the week, but not Monday. They don't believe in homocysteine as though it were religion. <laughs> why, well, what I wanted to point out was for all the people that are naysayers or they're cynical or they feel like this is uh, made up, there's an article in uh, February 21st, 2019 by Nature. And if you don't know what Nature is, it's the number one medical journal in the world. And it's called uh, Disturbed Homocysteine Metabolism is Associated with Cancer. Okay. It's a huge monumental breakthrough article. And it indicates that if you have high homocysteine around 15, you have increased risk for breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, colorectal cancer, lung cancer, GI cancer, leukemia, ovarian cancer, esophageal, cervical, and head and neck. And that's what we know right now. Okay. And that's a huge deal. And, and why, you know, no why oncologists run it. No, it's oncolo and they give you orange juice when you're getting your chemo. It's yeah, so it's crazy. Just, it should be standard of care. I think homocysteine should be a standard of care. Uh, and you know, it's the funniest part when I have a patient that has a high homocysteine, they feel like garbage. Uh, they have brain fog. Uh, you just give them uh, the right B vitamin and your homocysteine completely normalizes in a month. And they feel better. And they're my question: better. There's some patients you give them the right folate and methylated vitamins, and it doesn't go down. Commentary on them. I have a patient right now who's a functional medicine doctor. His homocysteine rides around 14, sometimes 16, and he's doing everything right. He can't bring it down. Any comments for him? He's one of my dear brother-like friends in New Mexico. <laughs> so I've seen that a couple times. I, I feel like people who uh, have liver toxicity issues often they still can't clear homocysteine. So for example, I had a patient that was a drinker, an alcoholic. He had dementia. He, at the time that I met him, he only knew his name. He didn't know the city, the president, the year, nothing. I thought he was pretty much a goner. But when I, when I looked at his homocysteine level, it was 56. Which oh my, is, I've never seen one that high. Oh my God. Yeah, which is the highest I've ever seen. Um, and all I did was put him on the B complex, put him on B12 shots, I also gave him um, cold phosphatidylcholine and fish oil. So the phosphatidylcholine, fish oil, uh, uh, methylfolate, folinic acid, B6, TMG betaine. I can go on a list of things you can give your friend. All I give my friend, I give this guy all of these things. I got his homocysteine down to 12 from 56, which was really nice. But I could never get him lower than 12 because he kept drinking. And I see this a lot in alcoholics or people that have liver issues or people that have a lot of toxins. So I think if there, there has to be some type of association between the liver, uh, toxins, and clearing homocysteine. So there, you got you to gotta really try every supplement on earth, and then I would try IV glutathione. I would try NAC, really get the, the detox systems wrapped up to see if they can bring that homocysteine down a little bit further. Interesting. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, it's not easy. Some, some cases are difficult, more difficult than others. Um, but what I'll do is I'll give you another case, which is really interesting here. Um, Okay, so this guy was, uh, well, he's an administrator I used to work with. So this guy was like a CFO of a huge company. And he was about 58 years old. And he was a really picky eater. 
Um, I remember when we would go to restaurants, he would pick everything off the, it was so weird. Like we order, if you were in a, a Thai restaurant, if he ordered Pad Thai, he had to get, okay, all the vegetables off, the peanuts off, the shrimp. I'm like, what are you just eating pasta with sauce? I mean, it was just a weird guy. You know, he'd always picked everything off and he was overweight. And he would tell me that if he ate any of these things, he got terrible reflux and he would flush. He felt horrible and he would have diarrhea. And I said, okay, okay. You know, maybe you're allergic to the peanuts or something. But what I did was I said, you know, let me run your genetics because he had these funny symptoms I couldn't really wrap my head around. And he was taking traditional antihistamines on a daily basis because if he didn't, when he ate food, he would get these rashes and these hives. And it was just, I, I honestly thought it was terrible food allergies. But what I did was I go, okay, what are, what are the doctors doing for you now? Well, they have me on acid blockers. They have me on antihistamines. They want me to do skin immunotherapy for the rest of my life. And they're giving What's me skin like, immunotherapy for those listening. Uh, those are little injections that they kind of inject you. They it works very well. Like let's say you're allergic to pollen. They inject you with small amounts of pollen week in and week out for years until they get your tolerance built up. And it does, it works very well for environmental uh, 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 allergies, but I think they missed the boat with this guy because they had him also on Imodium for diarrhea. And if he was constipated to put him on Linzess. So he was on tons of medicines for his IBS and um, he was, he was pretty frustrated. So I ran his genetics and sure enough, he had these mutations in something called AOC, the gene AOC. He had multiple mutations, double mutations. That's pretty rare. It's only in about 5% of the population. So people ask, well, what does that mean? So what people don't realize is that we have a lot of histamine in our diet. And just like we take antihistamines when we have uh, allergies, because antihistamines make you itch and get swollen and produce mucus and, and your eyes start to tear. That's why you take the Benadryl and the Claritin. Well, if you have a lot of histamine in your food, if you have a histamine reaction in your stomach, you're going to get reflux and you're going to get diarrhea. You're going to get bloating. And so sure enough, you can get also rashes, shorts of breath, wheezing. So he was 5% of the population that could not digest histamine, which is pretty rare. And so I said, oh, wow. So you, you're not making enough of an enzyme called DAO, which is the enzyme that degrades histamine. I said, wow, I never thought that was the case. I said, well, this is easy. If that's the case, I want you to do X, Y, and Z. I want you to avoid high histamine foods, which he was already doing, but I want you to also watch out for- What are the top five high histamine foods? So uh, champagne, wine. So people that drink champagne and get a headache, you got to think histamine. You got to think histamine. Uh, People that drink red wine and get a headache, it's either histamine or nitrates. So you got to think, you know, what causes your symptoms? And in addition to that, leftovers, anything like, for example, old fish. If you ever walk by an old fish market and you smell that disgusting smell, the putrid fish, that's actually a a type of histamine called putrescine and cadaverine. There are types of histamines that are produced. So when you when you leave food out, it it actually um, starts developing histamines. It develops histamines. That's why. Chinese buffet food is terrible, left out, leftover food, fish that's been left out for days in a fish market. All these things are really going to set you off. In addition to that, eggplant, avocado. I mean, there's tons of spicy food, peppers. All these things are going to reduce a lot of histamine. So what I did was I said, I give them a list of all the histamine foods to, to, to avoid. I said, just try that. And I'll put you on a quercetin, which is a natural mast cell stabilizer. And I'm going to put you on the enzyme called DAO with every meal. So which, was, what, what's the enzyme DMA, DAO with every meal? Which enzyme would that be? Uh, so the enzyme is called uh, DAO, diamine oxide, but it's uh, Histoquil is the brand I use. I use uh, Zymogen, the Zymogen brand, and it's called Histoquil. And it's the DAO enzyme, and you can take it uh, prior to every meal. But it has to be taken prior to a meal because you have to make sure that the mast cells are stabilized and the enzymes are ready before. So you can actually take quercetin and DAO, each one of one of each with before every meal. How how is five minutes before, 10 minutes before, like right 30 before? Minutes. Like 30, 30 minutes before? 30 minutes. That'd be optimal. And explain. So the mast cells are cells that inside there is the histamine. And when they degranulate, then they burst open wide and the histamine travels all over your body. But if the the lining of the mast cells are more stable, if they're more stable, then they don't break open to release the histamine. And you're talking that these things are mast cell membrane stabilizers. 
Yeah, because it's like a vicious cycle. So if you have more histamine in your food, that histamine gets released and releases even more histamine in your own body from the mast cells. So exactly correct. So if you take quercetin, you stabilize your own mast cells so that it doesn't release histamine. And then when you take the uh, DAO enzyme, it degrades the histamine in your food. So you're attacking it from two different places. And so we did it. And um, he told me that within two weeks, he was, he was so much better. He said, immediately started taking quercetin. And then, by the way, I also added um, a hydrochloric acid to his meals. So with every meal, I wanted him to take one or two pills of hydrochloric acid. Because if you digest the food more, if you add acid to your meal, you have left, less protein left over to react to. Because a lot of the proteins that you're reacting to are now degraded. So, so he said, was on an acid blocker. So did you taper him off the acid blocker first and then give him the stomach acid or give him the stomach acid and then taper him off? How did you approach it? So that's, a, that's a very good question. And I've treated a lot of patients with hydrochloric acid that have reflux, which just doesn't make sense, but it works. Um, and so what I do is I, <clears throat> I tell them to, to taper it off over two weeks. What I tell them is I say, okay, if you're on Pepsid or if you're on something twice a day, um, start taking the acid pills. If the acid pill does not cause further indigestion, then you're on the right course. If you take an acid pill and it causes worsening indigestion, then stop the acid pills immediately. Wait, so you're tapering at the same time you're adding the stomach? I got a little confused there. Can you clarify? So what I do is I start, while they're on the acid therapy, okay. while they're on the anti-acid therapy, the, the, the acid blocker, I start adding acid immediately to every meal gotcha. to see how they do, just to see how they do. If it doesn't worsen their acidity, Within a week, I'm telling them to back off like to half of what they were on of acid blockers. Within two weeks, they're completely off. Quickly. You know, it's funny. I was interviewing um, on this podcast one yeah. of the most iconic functional gastroenterologists. And then when we chatted on the phone, when the interview was over, he said, oh, I'm, I'm lifelong uh, anti-acid blocker patient because I can't, every time I go off, I get rebound and I just can't go off. I said, well, I could help you get off of that, but he, he never trusted it. And, and so he's not doing these protocols on his patients because you tend to, if it, something doesn't work for you or you haven't conquered it, you're not going to offer it. But acid blockers are often an M and M for an umbrella pill for without helping the root cause, and it's brilliant what you're talking to do. So it's very helpful. If you could just summarize that one more time, because this is a big take home for everybody listening in the audience. For the acid part, yeah. So yeah, another another thing, a concept that people need to wrap their heads around is so when you have reflux, <clears throat> there's typically two reasons why you have reflux. One is you have you truly have too much acid. But most people actually, I think, have too little acid because what's happening is if you don't have enough stomach acid, instead of your food being in your stomach for three hours or less, it tends to be, it tends to linger in your food, in your stomach longer. So if you're eating three times a day, right, spaced out by three hours apart, and your food is never really leaving your stomach, you're never completely emptying your stomach, you're going to have a low level of constant backsplash of acid on your, in your esophagus all day long. And I think that's really what's causing acid reflux in America versus if you have more acid in your food, in your stomach, when you eat some food within an hour, hour and a half, two hours, it's already gone through your stomach. It's digested and moving through and it gives your stomach a break now between meals and your, and your stomach can repair. So I think that actually low acid is probably causing more problems because a lot of patients that have acid reflux, what I will do with them is I'll try them on this thing. I'll wean them off their acid pills. I'll get them on hydrochloric acid. They feel better. They don't have bloating anymore. They don't have reflux. And then I'll have their GI doctors actually scope them and verify, and their esophagus looks perfect. Their stomach looks perfect. So I think it's an actual, it really needs to be taken case by case. I think now some patients do have high acid because I know that because when I give them the acid pills, they get worse. And so um, I think you really have to look at acid reflux. Really, everyone's different. And you got to at least try the, the, the hydrochloric acid pills. That's brilliant. I wanted so, to just add two little comments on that. You know, a lot of times when people go get diagnosed with reflux, then they're given a list of foods they can't eat. And all the latest science says that that list of foods is bogus, bogus, bogus. There's specific foods that might be reactive to you while you end up 
getting your digestion improved, but they're not that whole list. You don't often have to go off that whole list. That's no longer true. And I do think food reactivities have a little bit of something to do with it. And just- that's a, that's, about, that's a huge point. Another massive reason for reflux is food uh, food allergies. So I used to have I used to have terrible reflux. I used to be on acid blockers twice a day. I was on Protonix. I was on Pepsid. I was eating them up all day. And on top of that, if I did sit ups, I had reflux. It, it, now, when you have full blown reflux, I think it's true. Spicy food, chocolate, coffee, anything worsens because you are so weak that you can't handle anything. Your lower um, esophageal sphincter is so weak. Everything is, yeah, everything's working inefficiently at that point. But also when you take the acid blockers, you're also having other IBS, you're having indigestion, you're having malabsorption, you have the increased risk for cancer now. And so um, my issue was gluten. For when I got off gluten, I got gluten for three months, my reflux completely went away. I used to have uh, diffuse esophageal spasms, which meant my, spa- my esophagus, esophagus would spasm while I was eating food, terrible reflux, all these things completely vanished. And all my life, I was told that I had a hernia. I had a hernia that was causing all this. It was anatomical, and there's nothing I could do to fix this. It had nothing to do with food. And, and and for the rest of my life, I was taking acid blockers. And one GI doctor told me that for the rest of my life, every ten years, I would have to have a dilation of my esophagus via endoscopy because I would have strictures going down my esophagus. My esophagus is perfect. I haven't had reflux in seven years. So I think that, you know, when someone tells you something that you don't resonate with, you got to think outside the box. You got to go, okay, what's going this? What's, and you know what? If I hadn't been trained in functional medicine, I would have never known that something as simple as gluten could be causing severe reflux. And you know, they don't even believe in that unless you you come up with the the genes and have an autoimmune response. I had... Uh, yeah. really disrupted. It's called a Z line between the esophagus and the stomach. And my gastroenterologist, who's a really nice guy, a really smart guy, but thinks inside the box, told me I was going to need to live on very high dose proton pump inhibitors exactly. for the rest of my life. There was no yeah. answer. Of course, I have one kidney and I told him, well, what about the issues with downstream adverse effects in renal tissue? He said, I don't know about any of that. There's no studies on that. Well, there's a lot of gastroenterologists now being sued for people going into kidney failure. But what I did was use um, um, liquid oxytocin with mucolox, and now actually we're adding on top of that wolverine peptide, which is a peptide that comes from the lining of the stomach. So we can make this liquid that's incredibly healing. I did that for a few months, and then I went back. Of course, I was already gluten-free and eating great and everything and still having these symptoms. Then I went back and got checked, and I was perfectly healthy. No abnormalities, no nothing. I haven't been on any acid blockers. So when a doctor tells you that you need to be on some pharmaceutical intervention for the rest of your life. You can't, don't, that just means that they don't have the, the understanding of what's causing the root cause and then can give you a resolving answer. That's really, there, there might be rare cases where that's not true, but the majority of the time they're trying to make you be, without meaning so, learned, a learned helpless person. And, 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 you know, um, I completely agree. Uh, the mindset of traditional medicine has to be very, has to change and become more open-minded because doctors, I remember when I was tested with my reflux, they tested me for celiac disease and they said, I did not have celiac based on, I did not have the trans tissue glutaminase antibody and all the traditional things were not there. But when I went to a functional medicine conference, I go, you know what? You can, you might still have gluten sensitivity. Try going gluten-free and sure enough, it cured my reflux. And then when I did the genetics, I carry one of the celiac genes. Well, guess what? One in five people carry the celiac gene. That doesn't mean that I have... So this, the definition, the strict definition of celiac is, is basically when you're so sick that you're losing weight and you have ulcerations up and down your stomach, your esophagus, your colon, your ileum, and your intestines have literally atrophied. That's when they can biopsy part of your small intestine and say, you have celiac. But why are we waiting until that moment? Why can't we tell someone, look, if reflux, if you get reflux, IBS, diarrhea, constipation, acid reflux, whatever, when you eat gluten, and by the way, it can, it can happen up to two or three days later, which is why you have to eliminate it for three months to really know if it's a problem. If you have these symptoms, you probably have the gene for celiac. And if you don't listen and you keep eating gluten, you're eventually going to have reflux. That eventually reflux will turn into a stomach ulcer. Eventually, stomach ulcer will turn into a malabsorption and intestinal villi obstruction. 
and then you'll be diagnosed with celiac. So if you want to wait that long, you can wait that long. But I think we really need to be more preventative. We need to be more uh, proactive and get diagnosis earlier. And that's why I love my genetic tool because that genetic tool will pinpoint right off the bat, boom, you have the celiac gene. This is why I love working with you because you are an agile thinker. So let's yeah. take us over to COVID because we're getting close toward the end of the show. And this has been a great show. I'm sitting on the edge of my seat and I am sure that everybody oh. else, we are speaking with Dr. Eddie Maristani. He works yeah. together with, with Dr. Carol Roberts and myself uh, at the Nap- Naples Center for Functional Medicine. And I would like you to comment a little bit. There was a presentation in Italy, a virology presentation last weekend. So it's almost six days ago where they were presenting three variations that on genes that make people much more prone to COVID. I was wondering if you could comment on that and if you could comment on why they say type people with type A blood are more vulnerable to COVID, but people with type O blood are not. But then um, my hairdresser who's African-American told me that most African-Americans have um, O positive blood. So if you can make some comments on all that. So, so I can't comment... <laughs> I can't comment on things that I'm not 100% sure about. So I can only comment on the things that I definitely know. Um, the type A, the typo, all these studies I think that are coming out of China, I'm going to have to take a look at them with a team from Harvard and really, because I, I like to look at data that actually is very sensible and good studies. And it has, a you know, if, if it's real, if the P value is very low, I'll take a look at it. But I need to really verify anything before I, I state it. What I do know, what I do know is that based on SARS-1, so in 2003, when the first episode of SARS came around, there was a lot of genomics research done in China. And they did identify this gene variant called CCL8, which is a chemokine receptor variant. So basically, chemokines are like these signals that, that send, it's like a, almost like a cop, you know, in the middle of the road, signaling cars to go by okay so they're going to you're going to signal the white cells to go and attack the, uh, the pathogen so if you have a ccl8 double snip or double glitch you have more ccl8 which means you're driving more inflammatory mediators to damage your lungs or damage your body so basically what happens is if you get covid and you have if you're eight percent of the population has a, that has more chemokines you get a very heightened immune response like which a cytokine damage, storm that we're hearing exactly, about. Which is a cytokine storm, which makes you a lot more vulnerable to ARDS, which is acute respiratory distress syndrome, which basically puts you on the ventilator. And once you're on the ventilator with COVID, you only have about a one-third chance of surviving. And so it's kind of scary. It's, it's, it's really disturbing, and especially looking at all the numbers in Florida. The numbers are going, are going up now. We had the highest cases in Florida yesterday and on June 4th uh, of any, since the entire pandemic. So um, I'm trying to tell people- talking about COVID is making me cough. <laughs> yeah, you, you have the COVID cough. I'm kidding. I don't have that's the COVID the, cough. That's but the anxiety I, uh, cough. That's I think anxiety I have cough. an empathy cough for everybody else that's on ventilators. It got me yeah. coughing because we've lost now almost 114,000 Americans and we have 2 million cases. So my heart goes out to everybody who's ill. And I think I reacted by coughing. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. And what, I, what I'm doing is every time I see a, a, a study or something about your blood type, I, I run it by the team from Harvard to see if that is really good data. Because if it's not good data, they're not going to look at it. Uh, but what I would tell you is that I do, I am able with my tool to identify who has the CCLA genes. And I've had several patients that have those variants. And when I, and it's, I think it's good that they know. Because I said, look, you're the 8% that could potentially be a lot sicker. And, and what I want to make abundantly clear is there's a lot of people who really think this is not as bad as you think it is. Oh, it's just the flu or oh, it's not so bad. And then I, and then I say, you know, why do, what happened to common sense? There has never, ever been an epidemic so, so severe in our, at least in our lifetimes that the, the doctors and the hospitals are completely overwhelmed. That hospitals that are dealing with about one or two codes a day are now having 40 or 50 or 60 codes a day in the midst of this epidemic to the point where there's so many bodies that we have to have to put containers outside the hospitals. There's ER doctors that are killing themselves because this is very, very, this is very disturbing to, to experience. When you have people, I have friends of mine that work in the ICUs all over Florida. I have friends of mine that work in the ICU in New York city. And when you hear their stories, it frightens you. All my friends that work in the hospitals are saying, don't go to the gym. Don't go to restaurants, stay home. This is not worth it. Because they're seeing the aftermath. And, and I wanted to point out, there was a age 
is not going to protect you. There's a lot of people that are in their 30s or 20s and they think, oh, it's not going to affect me. Well, perfect case, uh, case in point, there's an actor named Nick Cordero. I think I told you about this. He's 41. I've been following him on, on, in the news. It's so sad. He, he even had to have one leg amputated and he's still not out of the ICU. Right. And so, so listen to how, how weird this is. So in January, I was in New York. I went to Broadway. I watched Rock of Ages. He was one of the main actors. He did a fantastic job. And then I find out that he's almost dead in the ICU. And he's 41, has no medical problems, super skinny, healthy, can sing for hours. His wife is gorgeous. And my mom's friend knows his wife. And he had, like you said, he has septic shock with DIC and lost a leg. So and he's still basically like a vegetable on the ventilator right now. And this is a, a healthy 41 year guy. And there's stories like this with 30 year olds. There's 30, there's, there's, so if you happen to be that 8% of the population, it's, it's scary what could happen. And it doesn't matter how old you are. And so I think people need to realize like that's, that's something where you should take seriously this uh, social distancing situation. You should wear masks. You should avoid excess contact with people and look at the cases per day. I mean, you can Google, you know, COVID cases, wherever you are, whatever state you're in and Google will show you how many cases per day uh, of COVID there are in your state. And if those cases are going up because of the rioting, because of Memorial Day weekend, you know, just, I would just stay at home at least for a month, you know, take it easy. Well, thank you so much for being on the show on so many different levels. You are a person who's occupying your bodysuit, body, mind, and spirit full on. I, I've met your mother, and she's an extraordinary woman. I've met your partner. She's an extraordinary woman. And I think you have extraordinary people that you choose to have colleague shifts with. But you've given us so much brilliant information. You would be lucky to be a patient of Dr. Maristani's at the Naples Center for Functional Medicine, and I feel lucky to work with him. If you like shows like this. If you think information like this is really great to pass forward, please go to iTunes and leave a review. At the bottom of all show notes, of which there will be of this show also, there are the three steps of how to do so. And if you want very soon, uh, I am launching a membership so you can find out what I'm up to if you go to drlindsayberkson.com and freely join my tribe just to get some cool emails from me and know what's happening or maybe where I'm lecturing. This is the year of estrogen vindication and I'm going to medical conferences all over the world and holding gynecologic meetings for gynecologists because we've pretty much given up hormones ever since the Women's Health Initiative and 2020 is my year of putting hormones back into doctors' hands to prescribe and and Dr. Maristani is one of the rare doctors that has nutrition, genomics, and hormones all under his belt. That's quite a bit, and yet he still has a trim waist. Well, good for him. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for thanks for being such a big, he- intelligent without being a big head. <laughs> You're a normal head. Thanks for being on the show. This was a really fantastic show. Well, good. I, I look forward to more, and I look forward to listening to all your podcasts. I love your podcast too, and and um, I also want to comment that uh, I know Dave Asprey. His interview was fantastic, by the way. And I'm using this aura ring, this aura ring to distract my sleep is incredibly effective. And I took last night, I took 40 milligrams of melatonin. I've had the best sleep I've had in three months based on my sleep tracking with 40 milligrams of melatonin. You know, I was just on Monday night, I was invited to be part of a group of several hundred pharmacists and I, that it's the group, but it's not exactly how many showed up. And we were talking on Zoom on COVID and one of my real heroes is Dr. Dennis Wong. He's a pharmacist in Canada. And he was saying because of COVID, he started upping his amount of melatonin. And since he's got, he, for him, he's a very small, tiny guy. He hit 20 milligrams. He said it's the best sleep he's ever had. He's, he's dreaming throughout the night. So um, melatonin blocks down cytokine storms, but it also really helps you, your brain get a much better restorative sleep. So that's a great comment to give everyone at the end of the show. Yo, melatonin protects you against, against uh, they've done studies in rats. You got to remember this. They took rats that they injected them with viruses and the, the control group was injected with viruses, but not given melatonin. The experimental group was given melatonin. The rats that got melatonin had like one fourth of the fevers, the symptoms, and they survived. The ones that didn't get melatonin got sicker. They died. They had higher fevers. Melatonin is very effective. So if people had those genes that make them more accepted, uh, yes. vulnerable to COVID, would melatonin help you not Absolutely. express those genes? Absolutely. Because, wow, it, excellent. because 
even if you're expressing a gene, if you're dampering the response, then you're okay. And, and, you know, it's funny that most people only think that melatonin increases REM or, or dreams, the dream state. But actually, in, in my case, it increased my deep sleep, my restorative sleep by about 40%, which is massive. That's huge. So I think- So, melatonin- you know, food is medicine. Yes. Hormones are medicine. Yep. Genomics are medicine. And if yep. you really want to get well or stay well, you really want to work. That's what the show is all about. Exposing people yep. to true agile thinkers. Look at Dr. Maristani is passionate about what he does. He's grounded in the literature. He said he didn't want to make a comment on the type A blood till he knew that that was verifiable. The articles out of Wuhan. You want people who are grounded, who don't sound unhinged, and who have a bigger tool bag. And that's what the show is about. So if you really appreciate this information, please pass it on. And I can't wait till I feel safe enough to come to Florida again. And I miss having a hug from you because you are such a huggable guy. And I send you and Crystal. And your mom, all my love. And the thank beach, you so much. In Naples, the beaches in Naples are amazing. You guys come over. Okay, all right. Blessings, everybody. <laughs> bye bye. Right. Be well, thank my you. friend. Be well. Bye bye.